Here we are. All right. Hi, everybody. It's so nice to see you guys again. Tanya Mlan from Self-Sufficient Homesteading and Gardening and Warwick Salsa from Beware. It's great to have you guys here. And we've got a very special topic today. Um, as some of you might know, tomorrow is World Bee Day. And what a Ooh. great, what a great <laughs> day to have. And uh, um, we have decided to give you a very good blessing by giving you a bee question and answer session with our expert Warwick so how wonderful is that and it's so great to see everybody Andrew Barry Rencher Robert it's good to see you back I haven't seen you in a hey, while Robert, welcome. and Noel welcome everybody I hope we have a great session or I know we'll have a great session tonight and uh, Warwick I hope you're ready to talk I am I'm ready to answer those questions so uh, how are we going to handle this actually yeah, we let's just, do some uh, housekeeping. Yeah, yeah let's, let's do some housekeeping rules quickly and then uh, we can hit, uh, yeah, we can buzz on those questions. Buzz on those nozzles. Come on. Okay, what I think uh, the best way to handle this so everybody doesn't talk at once, uh, do you all know where the hand, raise your hand button is? Everybody know? I hope so. If you don't, you better find it. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to be pretty quiet. Uh, once you've raised your hand, then Warwick can say, okay, fine, this is, uh, let's speak to, say, Barry, our ink pirate. And Barry, then you can unmute yourself and ask your questions. Just remember, guys, to unmute yourself and not just to talk because then we won't hear anything. All right. That's it. Okay, good. Then we do that. So, so that's far away. Who wants to have a go? If you can, if you want to switch on your video and uh, show us who you are when you ask a question, please do that too. Yes. That'll be awesome. I have no um, idea what Andrew and Barry looks like. Yeah, I don't know if we want to know. <laughs> 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 but um, yeah, no, just uh, kidding. But yeah, but please, guys, put your video on. Let's uh, let's see who we're talking to, and then uh, it just looks nice on the video, and we can all like. Uh, uh, get to know each other a bit better other than just seeing icons or something like that and a name yeah so feel free to put that on uh, if you've got noise in the background obviously that's understandable um or if you've got funky funky posters in the background that's also your business <laughs> listen but, uh, i don't see any hands so i think we finished for the night that's Warwick. it call it a night i'm off <laughs> down, down to the pub <laughs> who's first guys go who's have, got a question <laughs> i'm gonna go have some mead now <laughs> yes oh i see a hand it's barry okay let me just, just try to unmute my video here good there you go i look exactly like my logo brilliant love it <laughs> how's it barry <laughs> so i have an interesting question i am busy researching for a painting with remember when samson murdered that lion <laughs> and he came back on the oh, same man. road so what happened is the lion there was most honey bees making uh honey in, in the in the lion's rib cage yes so okay. so my question is i have to obviously i'm busy it's a, a painting i'm doing but now what i don't know is is that even possible and also how far does the line have to be decomposed before the bees will even do something like that? This is an interesting question. <laughs> uh, yeah. Good luck, worried. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very, I don't mind if you first it's, have to go find out or research. I'm fine with that. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, I've never, I actually must be honest. I've know that I know the story of, we talk about still Samson and Delia. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay yeah now you're working my gray matter um <laughs> cool, to my listen. knowledge i don't i don't imagine bees are likely in reality to probably move into a lion's um rib cage to build anything in there simply because um <laughs> they, they should have multitudes of other choices but having said that uh you know bees bees build in all sorts of cavities so yeah. chances are they weren't they wouldn't build in a cavity unless unless it's unless it's the skeleton maybe that's left over and that was a 
really an only choice that uh, they yes. wouldn't have they wouldn't have built in a carcass never okay. i've never heard of that ever happening um but i mean i know bees can I, i've personally have experience of bees building in those uh air bricks in um in the uh, what do you call it the old houses that have those air bricks as well in the wall under the bath uh, or even in the top of the above the windows they, they build in those uh, they build under containers. They build in all sorts of places. Eh? Um, water meters, pool pumps. Yes. Just about where there's a, a cavity that's bigger than 30 liters, they'll, they'll have a go if there is an al isn't an alternative. Uh, or even that might be their primary choice. You know? So a lot of guys do, make, do do bee removals based on this fact every, every summer. Uh, you know, it can be a business uh, doing just doing beer removals. Obviously, it's seasonal though. But uh, that's quite an interesting. I mean, to hear that, that that's in. The, I mean, I've heard of stuff in the Quran, and I know that there's stuff in the Bible, but I never I, 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 that that specific reference has has not been in my yes. um, schemata before. It hasn't been in my frame of reference before. So yeah, thanks for bringing that one up. Yeah, thank you. I'll go read it. it more. Yeah, I'll read it. Yeah. Research it. The only thing I will. You can find well, it's, it's it's normally not possible. It has to be decomposed for. And also, the only thing mm -hmm. that is left of the line usually is the skin. So I'm trying to think how can there won't be any meat or any you know like substance, but maybe the, some yeah. of the skin and the carcass or the skeleton. So I'm trying to picture that somehow. That that could be if it if it gets to the point where it's it's hardened over the. Um... You know, it's hardened and it's formed almost like what I would, what I've seen before is a uh, a bark, a bark hive. You know, that that would be the only kind of thing that might make some sense. But um, let's say, you know, usually bee, bees aren't too strapped for choice. But uh, it would have to have meant that that uh, carcass was pretty clean and that the skin was intact to to create a, a, enough of a cavity there for them to build in. Um, although I suppose the, the 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 ribs could have formed a bit of a structure for them to build on, but they would have been completely still exposed to the uh, to the elements, you know, which isn't unknown to happen with wild with yes. wild bees. You know, we call them feral bees in South Africa, but they're just wild bees. They're not feral. They're just naturally wild. That's how they are. We've decided to <laughs> we've decided to make you know to. To include them in, in our agricultural activities, yes. you know, they, we Ooh, manage them. You. We've never tamed them, but yeah, that's that's the only way I would see that ever happening. But are you painting? How are you painting this? Are you painting? Yeah, well, you know, the thing is, I do a two size. Um, I'm actually traditional. You know, like the old school, like when you used to dip uh, your nib still in the ink, like where, the way they used to write. So I do those uh, like paintings. It takes about. 200 hours or so but the thing is that's why the research needs to be proper so that when i do yeah. it it needs to be some somehow a bit of realistic i can't some re yeah um, some reality in it yeah. okay so yeah as i say if, if at all it would have to be a dry skin type based story uh where there's some sort of cavity or at oh, least I've half a portion of oh yeah go for it i i went and found it it's in judges 14 and it mm. says he was he he killed the lion and then it says when he returned to Timna where he killed the lion in other mm. words he went away and it's a few wow. days walk or whatever on foot wherever so mm. when he returned to Timna so it means it must be some time have passed mm. so that lion would probably have been a skeleton long or, time yes yeah, and obviously you like went that. you went to murder a thousand people so I think that might take a while <laughs> as well <laughs> that you might see. keep somebody busy even samson himself yeah but thank so, you i appreciate it yeah pleasure man good good question we want to see that, that. A, we want to see that yeah that the, that, that ma artwork make sure you share it with us i'll put it on beware and we can put it on uh possibly self put it on self-sufficient yes yeah, we that'd can be well. that'd be oh, cool good. thank you cool pleasure. great question next question any hands up i See Dan, if you it's just some housekeeping for those who entered uh, after housekeeping. If you would like to ask a question, find the hands up button, put it on like Robert did now, Robert Matisi, and then um, we will mention your name and you can unmute yourself. If you don't know how to put your hand up, 
just when we finish with a question, just unmute yourself or put in the chat box, we will help you. Right, Robert, fire away. Yes, uh, good evening. Uh, hi, Robert. Yes, hi. What you, uh, can you try and uh, maybe uh, answer this one? Right, uh, there is really a talk uh, maybe around Africa in terms of productivity right. for hives. Yes. Okay. Different types of hives, fixed, uh, top bar, and the traditional. Correct. Yes. And the, uh, what is your comment in terms of productivity of the hive? Okay. So, all right. So there's so so Langstroth, who I think was Hungarian, uh, at least Middle East in Europe. Um, he designed. He came up with the Langstroth design. Obviously, that's where the names come from. Okay, that was in the 1800s. And this that was based on the fact that it was quite difficult to move hives, especially log type hives and, um, and top bar hives, simply because they were so heavy and bulky. Um, and it also, especially with the log, log, log hives or bark hives, it, uh, it was generally destructive as well to the tree. So having said that, when, once that was designed, once his design came into place, he also uh, standardized the frames so that they could be um, so that they could be um, inter, um, what do you call it, uh, uh, interchangeable. Okay, so you you could I could sell my hives to you or to to Barry or to anybody for that matter, and you know that you would have a standard set of equipment of sizes and measurements, and yours might yours will fit in the one I sent I sell you today would be the same I could have sold you ten years ago, and they would still fit each other. Having said that, on terms of production. Um, this is a bit of a question. It's a there's variables. Okay. So it's a little bit like how long is it, how long is a piece of string? Because production is not a straight line with bees. It concerns the age of the bees. In other words, how how old is the colony? Is it a new colony? There is not going to be much production in a first in the first season for, for, for a young colony or for a new colony. Having said that, if they have the right amount of food at the right amount of times which is largely due to us as, as beekeepers to manage this for, for their benefit and for our benefit, you, that can be managed in such a way that you can boost that uh, harvest or that production okay, in the first year. But there's also other variables that come down to what food are you then going to introduce the bees to or what food are you going to move the bees to uh, because not all pollen and nectar is, is, are created equal. Okay. So you can have uh, in the beekeeping in South Africa blue book, there's the um, pollen and nectar scale of zero to four, zero being nothing. So maize and mealies, for example, have zero nectar. Uh, so it's nothing. So it's a zero. And then you've got things like red river gum, which is a four on pollen and I think a three on nectar, uh, other way around. Four on pollen, four on nectar, three on nectar. Four on pollen, four on nectar, three on nectar. Yeah. Um, and so on and so forth. So you've got some that are going to be four and four. You're going to have some that are four and zero. And because of the, the variables involved in, in the smorgasbord, if you like, of the, both of those elements, because bees need both of those elements. They need pollen and they need nectar to grow and to produce honey. And, and they need access to wax, the, the elements uh, that they require to build wax, okay, beeswax. All three of those and water, that's the other one. All three, all four of those elements add to the production of that, uh, of a, any particular hive or apiary. So the point is, is that um, when we go back to what type of hive produces the best, um, these other elements have to form a foundation in terms of trying to compare apples with apples, or in this case, <laughs> honey production with honey production. Um, I've worked with the uh, the Jackson Horizontal Hive, which is essentially an innovated version of a top bar hive, um, and the production on that's pretty pretty phenomenal. Uh, having said that, there's also a very big difference in the way you handle or manage a top bar hive, or at least a Jackson Horizontal Hive, than you would a, a Langstroth Hive, which will also have an effect on the production. Okay. But you can't move, you can't, or oh, it's very difficult to move that Jackson horizontal hive. It's 25 brood frames in there. So you need two people to move one hive, you know? But your production on that 
is is pretty good. I mean, you again with a variable of where the how much food there is, how old the colony is, etc., and also how at at what age the queen is, because that's another variable here as well. So I hope, hopefully, this it sounds like a very convoluted answer, long answer to a very what should be a simple question, but it's not. That's the problem. It's quite a complex answer. Um, so hopefully, you guys are okay following with this, but. If your queen, for example, is young, she was just virgin, mated, et cetera, then you're gonna have a, likely to have a new colony or she's a new queen in an established colony, that would be ideal. So number of times what ends up happening is, you know, say after three years, up to between, up to three years, um, a queen's pretty productive if she was mated um, successfully. And successfully, uh, by that, I mean that uh, an African queen be, honeybee should be mated minimum of 20 times uh, what, uh, with, with 20 different males rather. So she'll be mated on a mating flight, but she'll be usually should have up to 20 plus partners, okay? Or drones having mated with her. If that's the case, she's gonna have a really good ability to lay eggs. And her laying eggs also is, a, is an indication indicator of what kind of uh, worker bee force you're going to end up having and the quality of that worker bee force. Okay. And then of course, it comes also down to the amount of brood management that you're doing in the hive as well. So yeah, it's a long story, but comparing land stars to uh, top bars, um, there's one massive difference for me. Okay. The biggest difference for me is that um, generally speaking, Harvesting of the honey is is a is is a big is a big consideration because on a Langstroth hive you can use an extractor so you can use a, a honey extractor with centrifugal force okay which is spinning that honey out of the cells when you uncap it okay generally with top bars and uh, bark hives it's all being crushed okay. So this to me is probably between those two things, not, not giving a hell of a lot of consideration, although you sh one should give a lot of consideration to other variables I already mentioned, which is quite long-winded, but necessary to make. Um, if, we just, if we discount all of those other variables, assuming that we've got two healthy colonies, two very mature, well-established colonies, great queen, same food, all of that stuff, the Langstroth will beat the top or hive okay and generally speaking the reason for this is because when one is harvesting from a top or hive the comb is crushed and the bees then have to they lose production time or harvesting time in the time that they have to replace that beeswax or that honeycomb that's being crushed okay to extract the honey so the problem is if, is that, uh, yeah, how come, uh, welcome, Andrew. Thanks for joining us. Um, the problem is, is that when comparing all things e being equal, aside from the actual harvesting point, is that uh, Langstroth, all you have to do, obviously, is empty the cells and bottle and the, and, the, and the frames go back in the hive. Now all the bees have to do is refill it. So I've had hives that will be refilled within eight days. Langstroth hives. Okay, so the problem is, is that getting to the point where one can afford a budget of buying, being able to buy an extractor. So there are ways you can obviously get around that, um, which is uh, potentially even going going far back as uh, going tech, uh, low tech, as low tech as doing um, drip uh, drip extraction. So in other words, you need to have a you need to have a fairly high temperature for this. It needs to be sort of plus twenty five degrees in order to do this. But you basically create a, you can take a, um, what do you call it, a one of these steel uh, clothes hangers and create a bit of a frame so that the, uh, a wire frame that is, so that the brood frame can sit on it or super frame can sit on it at, a, at a, about a 45 degree angle and you let it drip into a drip tray or a container and then you swap it around the other side. Obviously, this needs to be in a closed environment, okay, so that you don't have bees and ants and other bugs getting in there and other particular biochemical issues. Um, you want to have a hygienic environment. So if you don't have a, an extractor or the budget to get an extractor, that is one format of doing it. 
another format which I have come across is you can use, <laughs> if you want to make a Magava scenario, you can take two bicycle spokes, wheels, sorry, and, uh, and create, build your own, you know, if, if it's, if a low budget, low, low cost type of scenario, you can build your own extractor that way. Um, but generally speaking, yeah, what will end up happening is that let's say something, let's say you've got a three week flowering, a three week flowering season on any particular crop. Most of the crops are three weeks. They're not much longer than that. Avocados are a bit longer. There's a couple of others that will be a bit longer, but majority of them nowadays about three weeks. So if you took the top bar put on for three weeks and you put the Langstroth on for three weeks, what will end up happening is that the, 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 there may be equal amounts to harvest okay uh within about 12 days of of, of the harvest or the colonies being equal but what will end up happening is that as soon as you start harvesting the two the uh the top of hive will take another 10 days or so up to 10 days to rebuild the comb and then fill it so you, you get maybe one more harvest in that in that second set or the, the other two weeks, the following two weeks, or uh, even uh, 15 days, the Langstroth I've in that same period could potentially have had two harvests. So all in all, you, you, you potentially get two harvests from the top bar, three harvests from the um, Langstroth, all things considered equal. Yeah. Great. So has that answered your question? It's it's a bit, uh, it's a difficult one to answer, but that's pretty much my, uh, as much as I could summarize that for you guys, that's uh, long winded. Oh, that's a good summary. Long winded summary, yeah. <laughs> great Thanks, stuff. Thanks, Robert, great question. Who All else right. has got a question? Well, Please raise your hand. And Robert, you can put your hand down unless you want to ask something else, so. Right, let's see, anybody else? And no, let's see. Nobody. Andrew, okay, what guys, about it's you? A, it's a QA <laughs> session. Come on. Bring it. Yes, he's putting up his hand. Andrew's putting up his Yay, real hand. Go for it, Andrew. Unmeet yourself. <laughs> I um I'll so I can't find the button for the hand, so I That's okay. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> that work. Um if I move my existing hives to a friend of mine that's got, let's say, abo trees, mm -hmm. what is the shortest distance away from where they normally stay at my home can I move them to? I am scared of maybe moving them and then the bees think they still can fly home to me. Mm. Okay, so good, great question. So uh, ideally what you so how I would manage this is that I would, I would find a spot that's more than about one and a half kilometers away. Mm. Move your bees overnight to that spot. Leave them there for about uh, two evenings, at least two evenings. Okay. And then you, when you bring them back, you put them where you want them to be. Um, that is probably the most generic uh, solution to the situation. An alternative, which which you could which you could try, is you can move your bees to wherever you need them to be. Again, always at night, because otherwise you're going to lose workers. Okay, during the day you're going to lose workforce. Um, move them during the night, and then wherever you place them the next day or that night rather, is you need to obscure the entrances quite considerably. Yeah. Okay, so you need to. Um, need to place uh, some kind of, uh, you could put even cardboard in front of it. You could put uh, debris, you know, like foliage and things like that. Um, anything, even like a bit of a marshmallow that the bees can eat away. Uh, something along those lines that they can, that you, that they will realize that there's something different. What's going on with this difference. But mm -hmm. I'd also have, this is the catch is just in case for you to be able to e easily tell if it's if that's worked or not maybe do a trial run of just one for now mm. but the easiest way to do this is to uh, and this does work 
It's just a matter of of um, making sure that they've that that entrance has been obscured enough. Okay. Uh, but what what I would do is I'd have a catch box in the existing place, and then if you have any workers returning, that at least they can go into that box for the night, and then okay. at that night you okay. could take them back and just drop them at the front entrance. So try it with one and see. But that would be my that would be those are the two solutions. One is that you you move them to somewhere that's more than one and a half kilometers away, a third party site. Mm. and leave them there for at minimum two nights because what happened their gps is really strong hey so mm. uh but it'll it takes them about two nights two to three days sometimes even a bit longer to readjust and then when you move them to wherever you want them to again it's going to take another two three days and then when you want to bring them back to your place same story two or three days to adjust um, mm. but as long as it's about a, 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 more than 1.5 kilometers away uh, at the third site that, sh that shouldn't be an issue. But if you wanted to move them directly, then you have to obscure the entrance uh, with um, so that they identify that there's something very different that's going on all of a sudden. And then when you do that, they usually take the time to reset their, their GPS as well. I personally prefer the method of just moving into a third party site, but I do know that the other, the obscuring of the entrance thing works too. Okay, so okay. how long do you obscure that entrance? Oh, no, it, it just... Uh, well, I'll leave it obscured. If you're going to put something like a uh, piece of cardboard or something in front of it, then the bees will likely either eat it away or it'll, yeah. it, you know, they'll, especially if you put marshmallow or something like that, they'll just eat but it away. But that's fine, eh? Hmm. Okay. All yeah. Right. Yeah, right, and if you. you're gonna put some de debris, you know, like foliage, uh, leaves or grass, that kind of stuff, then you they'll move it out of the way eventually themselves. Mm -hmm. They'll figure it out as long as it's not hard and fast, and it's gonna they wouldn't be able to move it away on their own. Then you know, then that's a bit of an issue. Yeah, I took I took uh, cut a piece of hardboard, a uh, small size, and I've hit a a nail in through that hardboard into the wood of the hive. So mm -hmm. I use it as a, a door like this. So when okay. it's open, it's upright like this, but when I want to close it, I, I just put it in front. Mm, perfect. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that could work too. As long as they can get out in and out, right? Yeah. Ideally you want them to be able to get through this foliage or through this obsc ob obscured, um, Okay, uh, yeah, item yeah. or whatever the case is. Yeah, yeah. They have to be. I to never knew about marshmallow. Really? <laughs> Bees eat marshmallows. They That's can do, yeah. Cool. Yeah. It's so cool. But it must be the, you know, softish one, yeah. yeah. No, they eat, you, you know, Tanya, they, I've seen them eat through even putty, you know, window putty. Good grief. And I've, I've seen them dig out through dried cement before. Sure. Yeah, obviously, we re recently recently um, put down dried cement, but yeah, I've seen that too. It's it's quite it's insane. They can they go through paper, they'll go through board. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. Nice. They're very industrious little guys, little ladies. They're not guys, little ladies. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Andrew. Else? Cool question. And it sounds like it's uh, yeah, Abbas are awesome, dude. Abbas, your if that's where you're moving them to. They uh, they can get up to three hundred percent increase in pollination in production over that six week period. Okay, so where they although they'll have about a fifteen percent drop in um, fruit size, so they go from like two hundred and forty grams an, an avo uh, with 50, 50 kilograms a tree, they drop down to about two hundred. 10 grams 215 grams but you end up with up to 150 kilograms on a tree it's pretty insane with avos it's the best result i've ever seen with bees it's really good yeah it's phenomenal yeah okay guys questions come on let's let's um we're halfway through we're trying to uh what other questions have you got what about winter winter management anybody what about products what about uh, how do I grow I'm, my apiary? 
I'm just wondering if the people are battling to find the hands up key. If you're fi battling to yeah. find the hands up key, Ooh, there's uh, Louise, Louise is wanting Louise. to ask something. There we, she found it. There we go, Louise. You don't mind if you're not sitting there in your PJs or something, Louise. Please put your <laughs> video on. <laughs> just hang on, let me just find it. I'm um, just what your PJs or the button. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Just hang on, I had it on. Sorry, I'm actually sitting on in bed already. I just want I to thought, ask. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure if you'll see me there. <laughs> okay. I just want to ask. Um, we we sort of ventured into beekeeping and then awesome. found it really difficult to source everything. But now it seems to be much more popular and readily available. So um, I'm quite interested in in or the question that I have is. The, is it a flow hive? A flow hive? Uh -huh. Is that your full sort of beehive? Um, does it do the same thing as the Langsfith or not? Good question. Yeah, thanks, Louise. Okay, so the flow hive is based on the Langstroth design, except that it it purports it purports to to the innovation that they that they've done is essentially they've allowed they've designed frames where you can, uh, it uses plastic, so it's based, it's plastic based, and the bees build yeah. into these frames. And then what can happen is that when you put in a little, a little pipe or you, you put in a pipe into the frame and you can twist, <clears throat> you twist the spoke really on the frames. And what ends up happening is that that creates a bit of a movement or shift at the back of the cells in the mm -hmm. honeycomb of the honeycomb. Okay. And, and when this happens, it, it effectively cracks or opens the, the back of the cell where the bees have been uh, storing the honey and it lets, it lets the, cell, the, the honey fall out or rather um, drain out at the back of the cell mm -hmm. down the middle of the frame and out the front, that front little tap. Cool design. Yeah. Um, quite an expensive design uh, from what, what, what I know about the price of these things. We do bring in mm. the frames only because, because it's much easier just paying for the frames, getting the frames that be you know uh, that will fit in a in a generic Langstroth hive. Uh, the only thing, obviously, is that you'll need to drill the hole and uh, and then so that you can use this the sprigget, you know. Okay. The, the little pole, but they are expensive, hey? You're looking at. I see so. Yeah. Five, I see six so. thousand, seven thousand rand for that. And yeah. I, I don't even think you get all 10 frames. I think it's only seven frames or something ridiculous. Mm, mm. So benefit of this, um, they claim you don't have to open the hive in, in order to harvest the honey, which is cool. That's true. Uh, you don't need to open up the hive to harvest the honey in, in their case. However, the problem, the problem, not the problem, but the responsibility still remains that one does need to manage the internal um, mm. uh, development, let's say. And oh, you have to do maintenance. You still have to do yeah. maintenance. You still have to open the, the, the brew box, the brew chamber. You have to replace those, you know, those frames at least once. Okay. At least once. So in your recommendation, would you say just go with the the generic? Because you can get four, probably four to five um you know, right. complete Langstroths for mm. the price of price of seven frames of, of, of the flow okay. hive. Okay. It's a nice right. to have, you know. If you've got the dosh, then no, oh, you know, go for it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But um, <laughs> if if budgets, if but you know, if budgets a bit of a you know, a bit of a thing, then <clears throat> you much better off getting the four okay. or five Langstroths, and then you know, maybe after your you know, second harvest or something like that, put some money aside and then, and then splash out. If you mm. still feel you want to splash out to get, to get one of those sets of seven frames. Okay. All yeah. right. Well, I'll, I'll, I've been online while you've been speaking and I'm looking at all the different resources. So I think the best place is to start with the course. <laughs> yeah. Ah, yeah. Pretty good. Great idea. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a great and the idea. blue book. <laughs> yes, the blue okay. books. Blue books magic. It's quite high end. It's like uh, you know, it it reads in some places. It reads quite um, academically. 
Okay. But it's it's a it's a yeah, it's like an encyclopedia of of beekeeping. To be honest, I think uh, I had I, I met Martin Johannes Mayer in South mm-hmm. Africa. Fantastic guy. He's actually a botanist by, and he's got a PhD or something in botany. <clears throat> but he you can't do botany without learning about bees, you know. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> but uh, okay. but yeah, fabulous Thanks. book. Really, it's a great book. You're welcome. Okay, super. Good luck with your well, beekeeping. I'll, I'll, which where, I'll be which in... area are you guys in? We're in the northwest in Clarksdorp. Okay. Yeah, so we we're not too far from you. Yeah, um, cool man. Come and see us. So We've I'll just... I'll definitely get online tomorrow and make arrangements. Okay, awesome. We've just okay, moved. Thanks. By the way, we we're still in Centurion, but. Uh, Okay. They have just moved, but we'll ship wherever in South Africa. So yeah, give us a okay. shout. Okay. Super. Thank you very much for this. Pleasure. What's that, Tanya? My two cents. Yeah, I want to give my two cents. Um, mm. Louise, you're making a very. It was Louise, right? Yes, Louise, you're making yes. a very good decision. Oh. Well, the thing is much like, and I've said it many times. If you want to ride a horse, it's so stupid to just get on a horse without knowing what you're doing. Can you hear me? I can see my okay, internet. Yes, now. I can hear you now. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Right. Um, it's silly to get on a horse if you don't know how to ride a horse. If you don't know a horse's behavior, if you don't know about a horse, uh, you will get hurt. And the same thing with beekeeping. You need to know, you need to educate yourself because bees mm. are dangerous animals just as horses are dangerous animals. So that's a good choice to go for a course first. And once you've done the course, then I, I, I bet you all your questions would be answered anyway, and you would know what to do from there as well. So good choice. Okay, super. Thanks, Tanya, for everything. All right. Okay, Dokes. Thanks. Thanks, Louise. Thank you. Bye. Bye. I mean, I'm uh, still listening. Uh, would, Bye. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> but uh, uh, what okay. I would suggest, right, is go to go to our website, beware.ca.za forward slash subscribe, okay, and get, mm-hmm. the, get the free articles, the B-mail that we call it. Okay, great. That's, Super. That's about 15, 20 emails that you get there, articles, all sorts of information about what's what involves beekeeping, what equipment you're going to need as a beginner, et cetera, mm. et cetera. Okay. Okay. Super. Thanks very much. Pleasure. Thank you. There's two hands. There's a, a, well, Barry's asking a question and Andrew's got his hand up. So let's start with Barry. We'll move to Andrew. Okay. Barry asks, do you get smaller beehives for gardens or is there rules around urban beekeeping? Oh, yeah, great question. Okay, so this one comes up regularly because a lot of the a lot of you know a lot of the people getting into beekeeping hobbyists and all that are urban dwellers, you know. So um, there are uh, bylaws uh, change from city to city and you know municipality uh, to municipality. So for example, Pretoria um, uh, doesn't allow any bees in the urban areas, as far as I know, but Midrand, you can apply for them. Johannesburg, you can apply. Uh, Cape Town is much more open the last time I've, I've checked, but, uh, you, you know, if you're in the urban city, then uh, just double check on your bylaws uh, with the municipality. And in terms of getting smaller beehives, yeah, so this, they are smaller beehives, they call, we call them catch boxes, okay? So they hold five or six frames, and usually they're based on a marine ply kind of wood. So they, they're not meant to that sort of temporary type uh, boxes. I wouldn't sell their hives, but they are boxes that are usually used for catching, uh, trekking colonies, colonies that are migrating. They, they suit that 30 liter type of space I mentioned earlier on, uh, which is ideal for a, for a new colony that's been migrating or trekking as we call them. And uh, they'll move into that spot pretty, pretty, pretty easily. Usually, if you even if you don't have them baited. But uh, having said that, the trouble is, is once the bees get into these little these little catch boxes, these little five six frame brood boxes, is that especially if it's in an urban area where, like Johannesburg's, like a uh, you know it's got a uh, city forest really, um, is that uh, it's got ac- they've got access to, you know millions of flowers within a one and a half kilometer radius and they outgrow that little box in no time and uh, the problem then becomes that they can get aggressive they can get more aggressive than normal or defensive i should say 
uh, in that they get too full in that space and or too hot, especially in the summer months. And then you need to upgrade anyway to a brew, to a brew chamber and or a, um, a full complete hive. So can be done. Actually, I'm going to eat some. Oh, you see any? Can be done, but um, yeah, uh, not for very long. I'd say at a at generally speaking, looking at about five six weeks, a week of frame, and then you have to exchange it and upgrade. Crazy. Okay. Great, Andrew. Andrew. Just unmute um, yourself, Andrew. Here we go. Yeah. Um, regarding uh, the cold, the winter months. Mm. Uh, we've got temperatures going during the winter about minus two to minus five. Uh, that period is for around about a month that we would get those type of temperatures. To look after my halves that I have, uh, can I cover them with uh, a, a carpet felting? Mm. Would that be good? Yeah, so you can use. Um, That's a good question. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, not to, I mean, there's not too many places that get cold for extended periods of time in Southern Africa, which is awesome. But we do have our black frost that, that can come along. And as you say, there are some places, you know, like uh, Oatswir and Kimberley, Eastern Cape, that get below, way, can be way below zero for a couple of weeks. So, yeah, um, in, in order to insulate them, you can use styrofoam. Uh, you can also cover them with the brown, those brown uh, sort of cheapy blankets. Uh, what you can also do is you can open up the hive, put a put in an empty super, and put a put newspaper down or cardboard down, and then put a pillow over that, like a used pillow or even uh, yeah. a stash of newspaper, for example, quite thick. Inside um, the super. Inside the empty super. Yeah. yeah take take the frames out. And inside the empty super, but just make sure you fill it. You know, you got to make sure. Otherwise, not that it's not likely that the bees will build in there over the winter anyway. But uh, you don't want them to have too much space available in there. So you can put in a blanket, folded up blanket. You can put in a pillow. You can put uh, cardboard and or um, a huge stash of newspaper in there on the inside. And then on the outside, you can put styrofoam, a blanket down, uh, wrap it with. Um, uh, even um, in, like insulation, um, that insulation material, not the roof stuff that's mm -hmm. made out of fiberglass, mm -hmm. but other insulation material, wrap it around, mm -hmm. use, a, use a, uh, a rope or a band that goes around a told in place. Yeah. Okay. That's a great idea because last year winter I lost my swarm and they basically okay. froze to death. So, mm -hmm. um, Good idea. I've got, they actually moved in. The hive is not even prepped or nothing. It was just standing there from the last time. And I took out all the, there's like four frames in there and there's bees in there now. And uh, in there now, they've in there now. new the ones have moved on, in. Yes. The lids on skew because I was just, uh, they're gone. So oh, lucky you. So they proper listed closed. Yes. So now I've got this, th these bees in there with nearly no frames. So I'll cover them up because a lot, Last year I was so sad when I opened the box and there they were all dead and I'm like, oh no. So yes, good idea, um, Andrew. And yeah, and you depending on how old that colony is, like if it's a trekking colony like your one now, Tanya, you need to watch out because then most likely not going to have a lot of food stores yeah. for this I'm winter. Okay? Marshmallows. So, <laughs> you could give them <laughs> you could give them a marshmallow or two. But what I was going to say is that also you could open up the lid. Yeah, and uh, obviously all the kit on and the animals away and all that sort of thing and the kids probably away too and books and whatnot but uh, open it up and then you could put in a container of white sugar just white sugar okay no water no no water and just okay. leave that there leave it in there and they'll they'll eat that up if they need to access that you oh, could great. make you could make uh, you could feed them with sugar water if you've got a feeder if you want to do that um but then I would I would do that. That needs to be um, a one to one solution. So one liter of water, one kilogram of white sugar, mix it lacquer, and then give that to them. And that well, you know that'll only probably last dry, about two days. Put a teaspoon of um, 
Mm. Is it lemon? Lemon juice. Teaspoon of lemon juice. That keeps it from fermenting. Yeah, or was it vinegar? Vinegar or lemon juice? Ach, vinegar, yeah, that's the other one. Vinegar, thanks. <laughs> um, so vinegar... In there, how long will it last the whole winter if I put enough sugar in there? If you just put plain sugar in there, then yeah, if you put, if you put in like two, three kilograms of that, that should keep them going enough to get them past the, the cold, the, the really worst parts. I don't parts. open the box again. In no, test. that's the whole point. You don't want to do that very often. That's why we do, we have external feeders at, at the shop. Yes. Um, and that, that's, you just use a bottle and you can just replace that ever. As, and what the nice thing about it is you can see when it's finished. Do you, so. do you also have entrance feeders? That's what I'm talking about, Charles. Okay, great. Feeders. That's an oh, external that's entrance lovely. feeder. Yeah. Great. So you can feed the bees. I would feed yours because if they've only just moved in now, then uh, like hooters, they're not going to have a, a large amount of winter um, forage. Nothing. Okay. And, um, and the, the, here's the other problem, okay, is that because the frames, you don't have all the frames inside that box, they're going to sort of build in their the way they want to build sorry Which say again means yeah. they're going to build they're going to build in there the way they want to build to fill up the space it's going to be hectic which means that when you do get to opening it up if they're still around hopefully they're still around come springtime actually august even uh you need to get you're going to have to open up that box and it's going to be a bit messy you're going to have to take the comb off and reattach it to the frame and the wires Use elastic bands to do that, or uh, that white string, mm. and then put it back in the hive. Mm. Okay, because they're gonna they're gonna fill that space now if they can. They're gonna fill that space and build the the honeycomb in that space without the frames being there. So you you're not gonna be able to manage that without the frames being in there. No. You're gonna have to you're gonna have to manage it yourself. And. And the propolis they use to seal the, the, the hive, obviously it's not there to steal some bacteria or something, it's to seal the opening. Can I harvest that when I open it? Yeah, as long as it's not gonna be, um, you know, it must be after the, the winter finishes. Yeah, but surely but, uh, the thing is, I won't put the lid on skew again. I'll put the lid black. Yeah, black. obviously, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you, can, when you do fix the lid and you fix the inside, because that's gonna be, uh built <laughs> built on their own now it's going to be a mess um yes. it's not going to be a mess but it's going to be uh you know you're going to have to manage that control that you're going to have to try and cut them off at the roof under the roof and away from the sides and then you're going to have to physically put them onto a frame rub it against the wire and then elastic elastic three elastics or three okay. little ropes and then you put it back into the hive uh, once you've done that, you can put the lid back on properly and take that like a propolis, and then you're going to put that in a solution of 180 proof alcohol, ideally, and then um, leave it, it shake, shake it every day for about uh, six to eight weeks, and then drain it, strain it, filter it, and then you've got a lacquer tincture. Oh, great. Can and you I, would, I, I, I usually do. Yeah. Okay. Um, I used to make, you know, when I was with, when I, when I get lots of it, especially over the winter period, when I'm doing my courses and things like that, when we get some that I have to scrape off away on the halves that we do have, we have to open because we're doing a course. Um, then uh, I use, I make a little boiler key out of it, you know, a little, I make a little pull, pull sized uh, amount, and then I'll just, you know, pop that. In oh, but obviously you must just be careful some hives i'm not saying our hives but some hives depending on where you're scraping with your hive tool <clears throat> um you know you could have residual uh wood treatment on there wax oil treatment and or aluminium based paint which would not be a good idea to eat so no. just be aware of wherever you are taking your propolis off guys that it um it isn't tainted with any uh any funky right. goodies yeah. Thanks, Warwick. Right. I see there's a question from Andrew and there's a question from Bar Barry. So let's give Andrew a, a chance. And after Andrew, we'll go to Barry. Barry's question is in the chat. So, Andrew. Uh, going back to the feeding side, 
Um, what I've done was I've put a wooden, planted a wooden pole. I've got four hives. So I've put plus minus in the center of all the four hives. I've planted a wooden pole and I put a flat, a flat plastic um, plate on top. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I grated apple and I soaked it in water and then I put the grated apple with the water for the bees. But I found now and again I found some dead bees inside there. Mm. Would that be from the seed? And is it good to to give bees food like that in the winter? Is sugar the only option? Um, it's thanks, Andrew. Great question. Yeah, so it's it's not it's not the only option, but it's it's usually a you know it's usually the commercial. Commercial beekeepers' first choice, primary choice actually, uh, just because of ease, ease of um, supply and how to distribute it, etc. But yeah, it's good, good to have done that. You can do fruit, you can do open fruit. Mm -hmm. um, there's obviously the issue of you know potentially um, uh, that it, it can also ferment and things like that. But um, and it might attract other things like ants and um, uh, which could, you know, obviously get uh, get it get access to that fruit and also birds and things like that. But other than that, yeah, you can do um, what what might happen is the bees could have drowned. Uh, that's usually the case yeah. with outside feeding, uh, especially when there's water. Even a water station, you know, you can have bees fall into the water. If they can't get out, they're going to drown. Mm. But in order to alleviate that or um, resolve that issue is you can just place the water and or the fruit for example in um in a whatever bowl you container you've used use marbles use pebbles that are, have just been washed or cleaned no residue on them use pebbles sponges. stones sponges could work marbles uh, might you know okay. might normal to go to thing um anything so that they have it if they do happen to fall off fall into the water or whatever the the liquid is, um, then they have an opportunity to be able to get out, dry themselves off, and then fly fly away. So you can feed citrus to the bees as well as uh, apples. I've never done apples, but uh, I've done citrus. The only thing you need to be careful of when you're feeding like that is that if there is capensis in the area now, some of our viewers or you know people zoomers tonight that are joining us, um, the Scoot a lot, uh, and the um, capensis are endemic to South Africa. And uh, so we've got two bee species in Southern Africa or South Africa, and the one was restricted by biological uh, barrier to the lower Cape escarpment or the greater escarpment um, area. So largely along the band that runs from Cape Town all the way up through to sort of Eastern Cape area inland to about more or less uh uh i'd say orange free state ish ish um and it couldn't get past that zone because it was arid and uh you know they just didn't make it uh, they couldn't get past that area until somebody one of the beekeepers actually decided oh i'm going to take my two three hundred odd colonies and go pollinate my mate across this barrier on the other side and out Unfortunately, some of these, some of the colonies and the queens um, migrated, they absconded and they got away. And as, as soon as that took place, which was back in the 90s, um, unfortunately, it's a biological damage really um, because the Cape or Capensis bee um, is unique amongst any one of the honeybees in that the female workers can also lay eggs and they can lay female eggs. Whereas all other honeybees, the females can lay eggs, but they're usually infertile. So they, they come out as drones, um, whereas the capensis can do both. So what ends up happening is they create pseudo, they can create pseudo females. And uh, essentially what ends up happening is that they get into a scutellata colony 
they smell not a, they also smell like queen it's good a lot of queen so they don't get uh usually don't get harmed or injured or killed or removed from the colony and uh if they get inside your inside your colony they become like a bit of a cancer they start replacing the colony from the inside and uh if you find this on it if you find an 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 instance of this in your any of your apiaries or your colonies, then that colony needs to be put to death. Unfortunately, it needs to be terminated to help curb the spread of this um, the capensis. Unfortunately, so the problem here, getting back to the question, Andrew, is that if you do do the feeding, what you could be doing is introducing or drawing, attracting uh, robbers, capensis robbers, and. Uh, so at the moment, at present, there's a couple of things that, that the DAF, Department of Fisheries and Forestries, now it's called something else, DALD or whatever, Department of Agriculture and um, Land, this and that and whatever, they've changed their name. Um, the department, some of the, the, the guidelines around this is now, uh, you know, for example, don't keep more than two supers on a box. We used to have up to five, six, you know. Mm. Um, and another thing is if you are feeding, rather feed internally or, or yeah. at the hive, at the hive itself. In other words, use an external or entrance feeder and or internally. It, it is, it's not always doable, but it's, rec you know, that's the recommendation simply to, to help mitigate the, in, the potential now introduction of bringing in, because um, our bees, both the scutlarva and the capensis are quite prone to what's called drifting. And unfortunately, what happens is, is uh, it's been found uh, that um, the workers, when the worker bees return or enter a hive, if they are laden with pollen or nectar, they've got food on them, they kind of get, uh, <laughs> they kind of get overlooked. So they'll, they'll have a bit of an inspection, a bit of a check, a bit of a clean. And if it's a capensis, chances are she'll get let in anyway. Uh, as long as she's bearing fruit, fruits of her labor. And the problem is once she's, once she's inside, then, then usually what happens is they go up into the supers where the queen can't get to, especially if you've got more than two where the pheromone starts declining and they will, uh, they start laying eggs up there. And that's where the problem starts, you know? Okay. So yeah, great question. Yeah. Uh, thanks. <coughs> Sorry, Andrew was also staying the death of the bees could it be due to the the apple pips um as far as my knowledge goes andrew you can correct me there's arsenic in small amounts in apple pips mm, that's so correct. possibly that's, that's possible. possible so i would avoid it but they could, could be drowning yeah. too so it, yeah i would just yeah. avoid putting the pips in and use use citrus over apple okay yeah okay then we've got um we've got some more questions here Barry's got a question, then it's Robert. Andrew, if you've got a question again, then we can after, ask after that. So first Barry, then Robert, and then the next so, person. Barry? Should we read the question or is Barry going to come on? What's, what, how do we... Sure. sure, let me read it, Barry. So when I smoke my tobacco pipes, the bees really gather around me, sometimes trying to land on the pipe. Don't they keep away from smoke? Yeah. <laughs> what do you smoke? Smoking, dude. Yeah, I was going to ask you. It <laughs> might depend on what's in the pipe, eh? <laughs> um, well, I, I mean, obviously, if you're in close proximity to the hive, then what's going to end up happening is that the bees are going to be like, hang on a sec, they uh, <laughs> rum and moly, okay, a maple, rum and <laughs> maple. <laughs> yeah, so effectively, if you're close enough to the hive, they're going to, their, their uh, what do you call it, their scout bees or their, um, uh, their uh, guard bees, if you like, may end up, uh, well, they will end up sm smelling the smoke. And because of that, they're going to come and inspect. They're going to come and see what, what's going on. Is this a threat to the colony? Because, wow. you know, specifically what's going to end up happening whenever there is a felt fire, that's what bees are going to do. They're going to react to the smell of the smoke. They don't react. The smoke, it's not the smoke itself that really makes them uh, calm. It's the reaction that the smoke induces within the bees that makes them calm. Okay. So what will end up happening is that they may be coming to just have a look and see, is this a threat? Is this a, 
is this a bad a bad uh <laughs> as one yeah great barry yeah so but obviously just be careful i've found the same thing with my cell phone so when i'm videoing with my cell phone or if i have my phone in my hand and i'm working with the bees it's quite interesting they tend to land on it and actually sometimes they even um come across it you know they actually go for it they'll go into the into the phone and then i put the phone away and hold my hand out and it, it's different take the phone out and they into that phone so i'm not sure Isn't phone, phone and smoke probably different different here yeah, it is it's phenomenal right but i think yeah. there's something ele uh, electromagnetic something along exactly. the electromagnetic status of a phone that's doing that with the bees but in terms of the smoke, I think that's more along along the lines of because they they come in to just do an inspection, they're checking you out, they're seeing is this going to be a threat, um, and maybe a small percentage is just down to the smell of of what you have in that because certain scents will also can can also um, yeah can also sort of set them in a specific mood, you know, because everything in the hive is controlled by pheromones i.e. sense uh, and by sense I mean smells you know so um, it could be something that uh, that there's a specific smell that of your rum and maple that you're using in your tobacco that's drawing them to you it could be the sweetness of the maple to be honest with you it's drawing them to you to first figure out what what is this nice sweet smelling thing and then all of a sudden there's some smoke coming out of it at the same time so they, there's sort of push and pull interaction going on there yeah great question Okay, great. Next is Robert. Okay. Okay. Uh, hello. Oh, yeah. yeah. You can yes. ask it, Robert. Go for it, okay. Robert. Put your video on if you can. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, but ask, ask the questions along. All right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there is a talk on uh, uh, integral farming uh, quite a lot, like, you know, area where we are staying. Mm. And the people are actually trying to integrate quite a number of activities, talk of aquaculture and beekeeping. Uh, how does the two complement each other? Doing okay. fishing and doing beekeeping at the same mm. place. Good. Okay, great question. Thanks. Yeah, so integral farming is probably not going to help with aquaculture so much because usually aquaculture, if I'm not mistaken, is in closed areas. Uh, it's in, in a closed system, okay? But... Okay. Um, in in the case where pollination is required inside a closed environment, um, one can move a a catch box in there, you know, for 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 let's say uh, three four days for them to pollinate any flowering um, plants within that system. But obviously, one would need to be fairly careful with regards to the bees wanting to probably get out, get out of the get out of the closed environment and not just harvest on what's available to them in the inside. Um, and then obviously wherever there's exits and entrances coming and going that people, you know, that the bees might try to get out of that and congregate around that area and also around any lights, especially around nighttime, they'll be congregating around those areas too. So just be a bit aware of that. But in terms of um, integral farming, aside from aquaculture, yeah, it's phenomenal. If you're doing, um, what's that? Um, permaculture you know it's not aquaculture but it is integral farming right so if you're doing permaculture then that's going to be exceptionally beneficial because your bees even if you just have the one hive those bees are going to uh, pollinate everything in a minimum of 750 meters from that hive uh, for a young colony and up to 1.5 kilometers away um in an established mature colony that they would uh, prioritize in terms of pollen and nectar sources. Okay, so the bees do choose one over the other. They do have uh, preferences uh, in terms of quality and quantity. Um, so you might have a situation where there's, you know, for example, lavender over here and um, Mm, let's see, uh, it could be something like um, sunflower. So the bees are more likely to go to the sunflower than they will to the lavender, for example, even if, even if they're close by, you know, generally speaking. So they will, they'll choose one over the other usually 
in most cases. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. So in terms of aquaculture, I don't, I don't think there's a hell of a lot of benefit in terms of large scale stuff, just simply because I, as far as I understand with aquaculture, it needs to be indoors or it's within structures. So we did do a talk about this, I think a little while ago, uh, maybe about a month ago with regards to uh, aquaponics. Uh, we spoke about aquaponics and then we had a, uh, and then we also spoke about tunnel, tunnel farming and tunnel pollination. It's quite specialized, but you'd have to have um, a very limited amount of bees involved in that system. And for a very short space of time, because there's not likely to be too much food for them. Yeah, I think it's a good idea if you go watch that that replay, Robert, because there's a, a myriad of information that we gave there and we didn't see you there. <laughs> you missed it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Listen, I see Noel's got a question. Yay, Noel, we'd love uh, to no. see you. Uh, fire away. Remember to unmute yourself, Noel. Sorry, guys, I've just stepped out of the room. I've just come back. Um, yeah, sorry, just a hobbyist based in KZN. I just wanted to ask about queen excluders. Is that something we we should be using? Okay, good question. Yeah, so welcome, man. Yeah, I'll see there's yeah. quite a nice growing, growing um, beekeeping interest yeah. in KZN and Hilton area in the in the Mian, in the Mandy Meander Valley or whatever. What's it called? Yeah, we we closer just above Maritzburg. So I look down into Maritzburg, Winters Kloof. Yeah. Lots of ever orchards, gums. Nice. You know, yeah. Spot, yeah. Very nice area, especially for the gums, man. But Abbas, yeah, also do exceptionally well. Um, and they're the one of the longest flowering sources of, of nectar and pollen, which was cool. Um, but queen excluders. Uh, yeah, so I've had a number of debates about this with people over the years, and it's I, I I'm of the opinion that there are I don't think it's black and white. I think it really comes down to your preference in terms of keeping bees. I think there's a good benefit in terms of using queen excluders, but obviously there is a cost attached. So you know. Uh, with them it's being so tiny, eh? say again so tiny compared to it, it's tiny isn't it compared to the work or the the, yeah, the yeah. loss you have if you don't have a queen excluder they go into your super and then you can't harvest yes right. and no that does happen but again if you're managing if if one is managing the 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 colony then it's um it's it's workable it is workable without a queen excluder it can be done. Uh, the, the, the challenge is, though, is that it then means that you have to open up your colonies, open up the hive. Obviously, you have to do that anyway. But now, instead of just being able to know that you've got 10 frames or however many frames of, of capped, capped honey, uh, yeah. honey, you now have to inspect each one of those frames to see, is there brood? Exactly. Okay. Um, it so work. it is more work. Yep. It's more work. And for the costs opportunity yeah. cost you know you've got to weigh that up for yourself so personally for me i've i've very very seldomly um do i not use a queen excluder very seldomly i have found it in some occasions though which is quite bizarre uh but i have found it in in a number of uh, enough cases for me to mention this is that yeah. sometimes a queen excluder whether it's plastic or metal doesn't it doesn't seem to have made too much of a difference but sometimes it does create a, a barrier. It seems to create an artificial barrier for the bees when placed above the brood or between the brood where, they, where it's normally placed, between the brood and the super and that a colony that hasn't yet moved into the super doesn't okay. move into the super for whatever reason. Um, and it's... Um, it's happened enough times for me to mention it, but it's never it's never been. Once I've discovered that this is an issue, I just remove the queen excluder for a couple of, for a week, and then I put it back in, and it's done. So uh, it's it's not a it's not an issue for me to deter me from using queen excluders. But yeah, I've had a couple of couple of interesting. Yeah. Cool. You know, a lot of people are like, yeah, but you know, bees don't use a queen excluder in the wild. I'm like, yeah, sure, they don't. But they also don't use Langstroth's design ever. Yeah. 
in yes. the wild. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So which one, which which baby are you throwing out of the water here? Okay. Yeah. So because just you know that's an inside joke, but just for the people that don't know what I mean when I say that bees don't ever use the Jankshot design is that bees build from front to back. They don't build top bottom to top. Hmm. Okay. And the other fault of the Langstroth is that the frames are perpendicular, perpendicular to the entrance. Bees don't hardly ever build like that. Bees build hor horizontally, parallel with the entrance. And there's a myriad of reasons of why they do this. And it's one of the reasons why uh, Robert asked a, a great question earlier on with regards to the production of um, comparative production of top bar hives to Langstroth. Yes. And, in, and in this case, if it wasn't down to being able to use a wire on a frame like the Langstroth frames are designed, where you can then take it's reinforced, so you can take it through to a an extractor and extract it. Yeah. If it comes down to it that we have in you know, comparing frame to frame or, or production frame to frame, you had the same type of frame in a top bar, so that you could extract it with a honey extractor. Top bars will beat at least the Jackson Hive. The way the Jackson Hive is done will beat a Langstroth yeah. 10 yeah, out of right. 10 times. Okay. But as I say, the caveat is, is that generally yeah. speaking, people don't, you can't harvest from a Jackson Hive or a top yeah. hive using an extractor. So that falls, that's where it falls. Okay. So if one, and I've thought of that, I've done this, I've, I've exchanged, I've cross, <laughs> cross pollinated, transferred. Um, Langstroth frames into uh -huh. Jackson hives, brood frames into Jackson hives. That worked wonders when I was testing it out that way because now I can use, I get the benefit of both worlds. I get to harvest it with an extractor, but I get yeah. the benefit of a top bar based design where the frames are p parallel with the entrance for the hive. For the, oh, interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Pleasure. And again, as I say, they don't use a, you don't ever use a queen exclude in that case, in that design, which is basically how bees do work. But in the way the Langstroth is designed, it, I personally do use a, a queen exclude just because it's simply, as far as a yeah. commercial operator goes, you're going to need you, the amount of time you're going to use in general. And they're all Cheap. guys, yeah. they are going to be guys that are going to turn around and say, yeah, I don't bother. And that's cool. I don't disagree with them. Uh, it's not a fight. It's not an argument for me yeah. about who's right or wrong. It's about your preference. So I don't know. You've got four hives. Yeah. Uh, you you got enough time, dude. I presume you got enough time to manage four hives without a queen excluder. You know. So you. Yeah. So in that case, my answer to you would probably be. Mm, yeah, I, I, eh. I must admit, I haven't actually managed them too well. I've been a bit. Too hectic at work. I haven't even robbed them this season, so I'm really in, I'm in trouble. Okay, yeah. so rather just buy that four four including extruders and just put them in. I would say. Yeah, will you send me the link below? Then I'll. It's already there. I've put it there in the comments for you. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. All Thanks right. And queen excluders. On a, on another note, just before we close with that question, is that they're not just used for in in the normal way you know putting it excluding essentially the queen from laying in the supers but they can also be especially the plastic ones you can you can obviously cut them into pieces and use them as entrance blockers on the front of a box nice so the use for that obviously plastic is easier to do, to use with than the metal ones are to cut but um the plastic ones then once you what's the purpose well the purpose is, is that if you have a trekking colony that's just moved in or you do a removal or a uh, you catch a colony you don't want the queen to leave you can then place that uh that um queen guard entrance queen guard in the front of that box for a few days up to a week obviously you want to make sure that the queen's mated if she's mated yeah. you want her to be able to, if she's not mated rather you want her to leave okay so yeah that's another benefit great. all right guys i think we need to wrap up thanks Noel. that was a great question man and good luck with your keep your beekeeping down there yeah thank you um, thanks. what's happening by the way a question i've got right maybe i don't know if how familiar you are with the gums but 
the industry at the moment, or not just now, for the last five years or so, has been moving over into modif GMO, GMO gums, blue gums, eucalyptus. Yes. Whereby they are now excluding flowering. They, so what they're doing, they're modifying that the, that the trees don't flower. Don't and, flower, yeah. And with, that, with that being said, they are also most likely going to start introducing some kind of inbuilt insecticide and pesticide. Just like they've done with maize and sunflower, yeah, and uh, and that's quite detrimental, I find, uh, to all the pollinators involved. Because just like you know, the problem with all of these GM, GMO-based uh, pesticide uh, enhancements is that they, you know, they um, they're generic. You know, they're not going to say, "Oh, you're a bee, okay, you can you can come and suck on our yeah. source in our yeah. our pollen and nectar." Uh, oh, but hang on, you're a army worm. <laughs> yeah. You know, we're going to take you out. Unfortunately, it hasn't yeah. got to that level at this stage. I'm just trying to think about our mountain bike around Hilton as well. And I know what like Sepi and Mondi, they've been, a lot of those guys are swapping out the pines for gum. But you might be, you're probably right. I wouldn't know which variety or, or type of, I mean, obviously the Sepi's got a lot of their research guys or laboratories here in Hilton as well. Mm. Um, so yeah, you, you could well be correct there, Warwick. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a bit of a challenge because um, it's a bit of a challenge because <laughs> you know, blue gums make up a considerable amount of the food, even though they major you know, they're alien to the they they're not indigenous to South Africa, yeah. Southern Africa. They make yes. up a a whack load of the amount of food that our bees, uh, you know, wild and managed bees actually survive on, yeah. especially certain times of the year, you know, in certain areas. So yeah, it's a bit of a concern, eh? Um, but cool. Thanks for the thanks for your question. Keep us posted. Keep us posted on your colleagues. Yeah. And by the by, I would, you know, mm, I would get into your get get stuck in there quickly soon <laughs> if you can this weekend. <laughs> See yeah, what any glad. any maintenance you need to do before the winter comes in because you don't really want to, you know, do too much handling yeah. June June July and then when August comes it's the other way around now you're out the other end and now you need to make sure your brood is maintained yeah, all of that okay don't and harvest too much time, now if you don't have time I don't know what to do between between two and three in the morning I'm sure you you got you got time there. <laughs> uh, I, do, I, do, I do work sometimes you're probably gonna laugh. But... I started really? my own business in, in March, April last year, so in construction, so I'm pretty hectic at the moment. That's good. Okay. Nice, man. Good luck, eh? Well, thank you. Yeah. But no, thanks for that. Yeah, I might, I'll open them this weekend and just uh, tinker a bit. I just mm -hmm. wanted to ask, one of the hard boxes, uh, I bought a whole lot of sick, it's just what, obviously there's quite a few a apiaries around Hilton. Mm. And I got sort of passed on one or two older boxes. Mm -hmm. And I had them under my veranda and I've had it twice now where, where new swarms have literally just taken them or sort of moved in. Awesome. One of the hives, I actually didn't even get a chance to add a super. Should I just leave that, that brood box then for the winter? Um, they, they, yeah, they're extremely busy hives. I mean, there's like, um, I suppose, as you said, there's no time to tinker now. Um, or, well, or, get in there this weekend uh, and have a look, man. If the brood look, frames are all full, uh, and there's quite a, if you honey laden, and it might not be, it might not be a bad idea to put super at uh, one super on. One super on top, yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Especially if you've got blue gums flowering around you. Yeah. If you got blue, no, if you got blue gums, that's that yeah. is liquid. That is that's gold. Yeah. That beekeeping gold. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Just uh, when I did. When I did Rob last, it produces a very dark honey. Is that just is some that... of them? Yeah, some of them yeah. do. Some of the the blue gums do do that. Um, so your iron bark, your iron bark, okay. eucalyptus. Okay, and and ever is ever good... as well. Ever is a great honey. That is yeah. dark. Can be almost as dark as molasses. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very dark. It's, but it's very delicious. Dark. Yeah, it's yeah. lovely, man. Cool. It's, Thank you. It's quite. Uh, yeah, it's, it's also grainy. It's a little bit grainy, eh? but it's a delicious honey, man. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Nothing like you, nothing like you guys have ever seen on the shelf of ShopRite checkers, woolies, or anything like that. Maybe now yeah, in woolies. Yeah. 
but nothing like you would have seen on the sh- on the shelves before yes. in your life, which true, is very true. this sort of uh, generic sort of, you know, um, the, well, everything that you know you've seen on the, the like a see-through, clear, little bit of golden colored uh, honey, no, man, real honey. Well, there's honey that looks like that too, but when it comes down to it, man, most honeys are yes. not that color. Yeah, I know the guys from what is it, Hilton Honey from Broad Beach. I know those guys, mm. so, like they were, what is it, Carte Blanche visited them. <laughs> yes, <laughs> amongst one or two others. Yeah, correct. Yeah, mm. hey, that's great not honey. that's not necessarily honey. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but uh, anyway, we'll leave that be. But uh, excuse the pun. Uh, okay, so we're uh, in closing. Yes. I want to say something quickly. Uh, guys, on self-sufficient homesteading and gardening, we're talking about anything that's self-sufficient that you can maintain yourself. Beekeeping is one of them. So if you want to join our group and just give us some updates, Noel, we love that. I know you're very busy. Or anybody else, Andrew, Flint, you're very quiet, but I know you've got bees. <laughs> so if you want to join self-sufficient homesteading and gardening and come post some of your bee stuff there we would love to hear and there's a lot of people that would love to learn as well and i'm sure they will be able to learn from you guys as well so i've posted the link there uh, feel free to join us we're a group of 22,000 like-minded people and we have loads of fun on that group and awesome. thank you for joining us tonight hey thank you warwick for for answering all the questions now you can have a cup of coffee <laughs> yeah gonna go grab dinner but and coffee thanks and yeah it's been awesome to have you guys on thanks for joining us guys and happy world bee day tomorrow uh, let's celebrate for the all the pollinators out there yeah hey. it's great man i like to it's it's amazing sharing your passion and uh interests especially with these little ladies i mean they're just phenomenal you know they're responsible I uh, respect and honor, the, honor them so much, man. I mean, I even, I had a choice as a career anyway, many moons ago to choose between sort of things like stock market and uh, e- economics and that sort of thing and beekeeping. I thought, you know what, the, uh, I, see, I see bees as the, as, the, as the clear choice really at the end of the day, simply because they can affect our lives and influence our lives so much um, uh, in all sorts of ways. So yeah, there we are. Um, thanks to the bees and uh, hope you guys have an awesome evening and a great month ahead. Thanks Yay. for joining us. We'll thanks see you next week. Us. Yes. Bye, guys. Ciao, guys. Take care. Happy beekeeping. <laughs>